Welcome to Lorology. Sure, other courses might talk about geometry or engineering, but here we talk about equally important things. Things like flying murder Roombas and giant robots. I'm your humble host, Lorcus the Loremaster, and with me as always are my faithful students, Seth and Brady. Say hi, boys. Hi, hi boys. boys. Now, before we start today's lecture, let me ask you boys something. Have you ever found something wasn't quite what it seemed? Most often with food. Yeah, you look at it and you go, that looks pretty good. And then you try it, and it's hot dog water. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be something of a theme today, because we'll be learning about 40K's most polarizing faction, the Tau. Don't let their sleek 70s anime look fool you. These guys have had their fair share of grit. Theirs is a tale of idealism corrupted and soldiers betrayed by their nation. So, strap into your stealth suits, kids. We're going for a ride. Well, thankfully, we're not dealing with the old ones this time. In fact, the Tau are a relatively new civilization, with some of the earliest records of them coming from an Adeptus Mechanicus exploration vessel in the 35th millennium. When the science of Mars found the Tau, they were more or less cavemen, having just figured out fire. You'd think that this being the Imperium, they just drop some soldiers and engage in some light genocide, but nah. These were the Mechanicus, you see. Tech worshippers. And since these guys hadn't even figured out the advanced science of pointy sticks, the priests marked them as being of no consequence and just sort of left. Okay, so the tech priests have like the Starship Enterprise, basically, yeah. a bunch of them. And they're like, to fight space, the final frontier. Yeah. So they send these things out, and they found the Tau, who were like very primitive at the time they were discovered. In the 35th millennium, that was only like 5,000 years ago. Yeah, and they said, you, you're dumb. We're just going to leave you. So this is almost like aliens, the, the theory of aliens. Aliens discovering us as, and yeah. leaving us, like, helping us build the pyramids. Yeah, with the pyramids. And then being like, all right, peace off, or peace out, we'll see. I mean, think about it. The pyramids were built about 5,000 years ago, and we now are a space-faring society, technically. Well, centuries went by, and a few tribes started to rise in power clashing with one another over resources and land, you know, like you do. Which leads us to the Battle of Fio Town. Now, Codex has described the Tau as using cannons and stone fortresses at this point, so we can assume they were at least at their renaissance. The citizens of the fortress city of Fio Town were at war with a tribe from the plains. Whatever kicked this conflict off must have been bad, though, because the plains-dwelling tribes would settle for nothing less than the complete destruction of the city and the death of everybody inside. Diplomats from the city were sent to negotiate with the plains folk, but each diplomat was chopped up into 12 separate pieces and sent back to the city in a box like so much fried chicken. There's there's point A and there's point B. Point A being mud men. Mud men. Point B being badass mechanized suits so. with su with melting radioactive nonsense. So I'll be honest, I'm a little confused. <laughs> how, did, how did we get there? With disease ravaging the citizens of the city and food supply running low, the people began to get desperate. But just when all hope seemed lost, two mysterious strangers appeared on the horizon. One approached the city of Fio Town, while the other walked towards the camps of the Plains tribes. Normally, these strangers might have been attacked or shut out, but they both exuded such a powerful charisma and authority that nobody could even think to raise their weapons or lock their gates. Both ventured deep into the territories of the Warring Sides and began to speak. They identified themselves as the Ethereals and came bearing a message of the greater good. The Ethereals extolled the ideals of peace, understanding, and cooperation among the Tau. You'd think, this being 40k and all, that they'd be immediately murdered or eaten or something. But no, both sides actually listened. In fact, within hours, the two tribes who'd been warring for years had found a peaceful truce for all involved. Okay, so like basically they were fighting each other and then two guys like Moses showed up and were like, let my people go. And like, they said, they, they were like chill and everybody was like, okay. Chill, yeah. These two ethereals weren't the only ones of their kind. Hundreds of these mysterious Tau just started popping up all over the planet. They started settling everything from major wars to minor arguments, all with the power of peaceful communication and an almost supernatural charisma. The Ethereal soon established a series of lessons called the Tau Va, or the Greater Good. These lessons proved extremely popular. Soon every tribe, state, and nation united, and the Tau Empire was born! 
The Tau focused on advancing their technology and started speed running scientific advancements. They quickly went from cannons and castles to starships and mech suits. It can't be overstated how quickly their tech was advancing here. Feats of technology that would have taken millennia of scientific development were taking near centuries or even decades to accomplish. Having mastered faster than light travel, energy weapons, and even artificial intelligence, the Tau were at a stage of development that rivaled humanity during its golden age, even outpacing it in places. Now, the tech priests who wrote the sector off were probably kicking themselves, which just goes to show you, be careful who you call primitive in high school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good. That was a good one. Okay. It seems like they're, like, the Gandhi of this situation. They start off as, like, really kind and everything. But I know there's... They I are, keep saying something. There's something sinister there's something going weird. on. I have an idea. I have an idea. All right, let's hear the Conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory. Wait, okay, but before you do, comment down below and let us know where you think the towel came from, or if you know. Uh, because I have no idea. This doesn't seem to make any sense. It's like they just, these Tau, who look just like everybody else, appear out of nowhere. What are they, like parasites in disguise or something? Oh, oh even better. All right, All right let's okay, hear Brady's so theory. What color are the Tau? The Tau are blue. What color are, what color is each? I'm thinking... Theory dashed. <laughs> God of... Chaos deception, and deception. Oh. might have something to do with this. Dang, okay, okay, let's see if that theory pans out. Well... To put it simply, the greater good was the idea that every sentient being could strive to do the most good for the most people they can. This philosophy idealizes things like peace, diversity, and selflessness. It was also secular, existing outside of any established religion. This meant that those different faiths could still have a place in the greater good. So there was no need for any conflict over religion. Seems really nice, doesn't it? Well. Remember what I said about appearances. After the Ethereals united the Tau, they established a rigid caste system. Now, for those of you who don't know, a caste system is when your potential occupations or role in society is based entirely on the circumstances of your birth. There are five castes in total, each one based on the elements, and uh, just save your last airbender jokes for now. Now, onto the castes. First, there was the fire cast. These guys are your soldiers, officers, and mech pilots. Earth casts were engineers, scientists, and all-around nerds. Air casts are your hotshot fighter pilots and naval commanders. We're not sure if they have homoerotic volleyball games like in Top Gun, but if they don't, they should. Lorcas, has anybody ever told you how freaking funny you are? Water casts are diplomats, storytellers, and bureaucrats. There's probably some water cast geek making lore videos right now. And last but not least are the Ethereals themselves. Who are the head honchos, state leaders that run the Ethereal Council, which serves as the absolute authority of the Tau Empire? Now, you might think it's a little suspicious that the system the Ethereals devised put them in complete control of Tau society. But, I mean, it was probably fine. It's, it's not like power is inherently corruptive or anything. Just, you know, keep your head down and, and stop asking questions. It's all for the greater good. Really, we promise. So anyway, the Tau show up out of nowhere, help the society go, you know, advance millennia in mere centuries, and then establish a very rigid caste system in which they are, of course, at the top. So where, where does this all lead us? What's next here? Now, despite the, shall we say, questionable nature of their power structure, as the Tau began to expand their spheres of influence in other systems, other species started to see the appeal of the greater good. These species would sign on with the Empire as peaceful negotiation was sort of the Tau's default. Some species took advantage of this, like the Drukhari, aka the Dark Eldar, who used a peaceful negotiation as an excuse to steal some Tau slaves, which they then turned into tortured cybernetic monsters called Pain Engines. Man, who'd have thought the spiky elves calling themselves the Prophets of Flesh were actually a bunch of gross torture weirdos? Live and learn, I guess. Um, where in the caste system do the people who side with the, uh, do like, do they belong in the caste system or is that like a whole different thing? Uh, they're considered auxiliaries, which means while they can't really hold any major positions in office, uh, they can still like earn a place of honor or regard in Tau society. Little culty, little culty. But other species were actually more receptive to the idea of peaceful negotiation and the whole greater good thing. Some of the more well-known species in the Empire include the Insectile Vespid, 
who largely kept to themselves but appreciated the collectivist nature of the greater good. And then there's the crew, tribal hunters who can rapidly evolve by taking on the DNA of those they eat. But most surprisingly of all is the fact that the Tau actually have human citizens. Compared to the harsh, dogmatic rule of the fascist Imperium, many humans see the gentler, collectivist ideas of the Tao as a welcome alternative. These human citizens, called Gwe Vesa, are permitted to live in equal footing with Tao citizens and can even attain places of honor in their society. There's, there's got to be something going on. Like, they're, they're, they're all, it's too good. It's too, too good to be good. true. I don't it's understand. too good to be true. Here's where it gets even better. You'd think that with all this peace and prosperity, the Chaos Gods would come along and take them down a peg or two. Maybe cause a demonic apocalypse like they did with humanity in the Age of Strife. But surprisingly, Tau remain largely untouched by spooky wizard nonsense for quite a while. Tau seem to have a relatively faint presence in the warp. So faint, in fact, that they don't even manifest psychers like some other species do. And since their FTL travel focuses on skimming across the warp rather than diving deep into it like humans do, they've had precious few encounters with the ruinous powers. With relatively stable genetics, they've also had very few experiences with demonic mutation. Those times that they've encountered these seemingly supernatural phenomena, they view it more scientifically, which most factions are often very rarely keen to consider. What others might call sorcery or miracles, the Tao simply see as another kind of science to be studied. Demonic corruption and possession are just another illness to be cured. But with humans incorporated into the Tao Empire, the warp has begun to manifest strange entities that reflect the idea of the greater good. Those few Tao that have witnessed this event now view humans with suspicion or even outright contempt. That said, the Ethereals seem to know more than they're letting on regarding both the warp and the Tao's relation to it. But if they do know, they're not telling anyone. We have groups of people who are not traveling with using the warp and who are also not like susceptible to demonic possession, susceptible, susceptible to mutation, demonic mutation, susceptible to the chaos gods. Okay, so Siege is <laughs> this is Siege is doing I love first of all you're on and it. and second of all, I think they're not using the warp because they don't want the other chaos gods getting an idea getting of what's in, going on in here. Their head. What's going on? Now, you've probably picked up that the Ethereals aren't exactly telling us the whole story. And since they're the ones who get to say who writes the history books, they get to control the narrative. But the facade has begun to crack. Enter Commander Farsight, a firecast commander who had proven himself in campaigns against both the Marauding Orcs and the Imperium of Man. During an expansion into the Damocles sector, Farsight ran afoul of an ambush that saw his ethereal boss slain. Now, Tau were always told that without an ethereal's guidance, they were effectively doomed to fall to disunity and chaos. But, cap, lowercase c, chaos. But here was Farsight and his armies doing just fine. In fact, he had continued to lead successful military campaigns without the Ethereals looking over his shoulder to greatest performance. And even without the Ethereals guidance, his people held to the values of the greater good, giving of themselves to help those around them. Farsight couldn't help but feel like something was off. Maybe uh, he has the foresight to do something yeah. about it, right? <laughs> oh. Cha. Captain Farsight has foresight. Like a kid finding himself in college, Farsight asked himself some tough questions. If they were still able to make tactical decisions and even hold to their values without the ethereals, what were these old geezers even for? Why had he never thought to ask himself that years ago? When the ethereals ordered him to kill his mentor so they could download his knowledge into a chip, why didn't he just say no? And why had they kept the nature of the warp a secret when demons were such a huge problem? After a bit of meditation, Farsight had a terrible epiphany. The Ethereals weren't just keeping people in the dark. The reason he'd never defied their direct orders was because he physically couldn't. The Ethereals had been brainwashing the Tao! Dun dun dun! Wait, like... Like literally, like like com like magically or psychically compelling them, they had been passively brainwashing the Tao with some kind of weird ambient brainwashing field. It's what we call a cult. What? Drink a little too much of the Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid. Oh my God. Now to say Farsight was ticked off is putting it lightly. I mean. 
How would you feel if it turned out that your boss had been secretly mind-controlling you the whole time? And here he was, setting up Colony World so the Ethereals could, what, get their greasy little mitts on more Tau brains? Nuh-uh. Farsight took a stand. The commander gathered up his armies and colonized a bunch of worlds as planned, but declared their independence from the Empire. Although he now despised the Ethereal cast and their manipulation, he still genuinely believed in the greater good and its ability to unite races in peace. And when it came time to elect a leader for this more democratic society, the people wanted Farsight to rule. But Farsight was hesitant. Peace had always been a pillar of the greater good, and Farsight didn't want these newly freed people to be run by some bloody-handed warrior like him. So, rather than take the offer, he stepped down and went to live off in the woods somewhere. Despite his exile, though, Farsight has been known to come out of retirement to knock some heads like a real 80s action hero. I'm, so there's this thing, it's like, I don't know what it is or where I picked it up, but it feels like the purse. oh, I, I know where I picked it up. Mm. Um, but it's this great uh, adage of like, the person who's the, the, the most likely person who's the best to rule is the person who doesn't want to. Yep. Like Marcus Aurelius was the greatest empire that Rome had ever known, and he was the one freaking guy who didn't want to do the job. He hated it, he yeah. hated doing it, but because he didn't like the power, yeah. he didn't like the responsibility, it made him very cautious with it and made him smart. So that's very interesting that Farsight like, denied the opportunity to seize power, especially coming from a society where a caste-based society where you'd think that anybody would jump Man, at the opportunity yeah. to like, especially because he's fire cast. Meanwhile, back at the Empire, the Ethereals figured that Commander Farsight and his forces must have been wiped out, since their Ethereal contact went silent and Farsight wasn't answering their texts. Thus, the Ethereal Council dubbed him a heroic martyr for the greater good. But when it came out that he'd set up his own empire founded on the idea that the Ethereals could suck it, they quickly changed their tune and labeled him a dirty, stinky traitor. That said, even if they don't like the Enclaves, they're not above asking for help when things get really dicey, and Farsight's forces are more than happy to lend a hand, if only so that they can style on their exes a little bit. I love that. The Dell's like, you're a dirty, stinky traitor, but also, will you help us, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> now, to peek behind the curtains a bit, the Tau were something of a polarizing faction among fans, Many cited their optimistic, peaceful nature and sleek, futuristic look as not really fitting with the setting's vibe of grim, gothic space fantasy, and the Macross-inspired battle suits with the society's obsession of selflessness and honor led to some accusations of Orientalism. Games Workshop seemed to respond to this fan sentiment by retconning them into something more sinister, introducing the brainwashing and anti-human sentiment in later editions. But then the Psychic Awakening storyline introduced the Farsight Enclave. Through Farsight and his buddies, we can see a hint of that noble spirit that still embodies the Tao and the greater good. It's just that those ideals were seized by opportunistic power brokers. The Tao teach a valuable lesson, that beautiful philosophies can unite people in their darkest hour, but selfish individuals can just as easily use those ideals as an avenue to take control. When that happens, like Commander Farsight, it becomes the duty of others to question authority and defy tyranny, a lesson the Imperium of Man forgot long ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you were bringing us into a philosophy lesson. Yeah. Where this... this dang, this one got heavy real fast. I there. think I think the thing that we have to realize is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Games Workshop isn't working on something that is stagnant. And Games Workshop is working on an overarching storyline with things that change. So what I see as this as is like, maybe the tower just introduced as this faction that were supposed to be like this, but then it cut, like the story develops over time where stuff comes out and that sort of stuff. So I, I understand where it doesn't really like fit among the fans, but I, I do think that, you know, at least GW had, you know, they have an idea of what, what they're doing, yeah. you know? And I think that, again, it's like, they, they want to tell a story here. They don't want to just be like, and here's these guys. This is their deal, yeah. you know? No, I mean, there's something to be said for like the narrative of these societies as they interact with the game and like in the game world. I think that's really interesting though. And the tower, I mean, like, I don't know. It's, they're, they're very interesting to me. But 
But I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today's lecture. But what about you guys? Do you support the greater good? Who's better, the Farsight or the Empire? And what faction, characters, or events should we cover next? Let us know in the comments below. Hit the like button and tell the Ethereals they can suck it. And subscribe to become part of the greater good. But before we go, if you're going to take anything from this lecture, let it be this. Peace is nice and everything, but when the going gets tough, it never hurts to have a giant robot and a railgun or two. I'm Blorcus the Loremaster, class dismissed!